Hello, everyone. Welcome back to session number 11 in this series uh, that we started in late March uh, around the question, what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, looking at the different issues related to that question of internet access, and uh, I'll touch on those in a second. Um, we are uh, around 1,500 people who have registered for the series so far. Uh, many of you, most of you are returnees. Welcome back. Uh, and for those of you who are here first time, welcome. And we hope you'll, you'll stay with us as this continues to evolve in the circumstances of the whole pandemic evolving. Uh, we have uh, an excellent program today. Uh, we've got two uh, presentations from outstanding libraries in Ohio and uh, Deutschland und Deutschland in, in Germany, and we'll, uh, we'll meet them shortly. Our sessions are being hosted by uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, uh, representing the world's 400,000 plus public libraries and other types of libraries. Uh, but it's really only the public libraries, generally speaking, that are in the business of offering access to the public. And so that's been our point of uh, focus is wider access, universal public access in a word. And um, so we've had, so far we've had 31 presentations. We'll have two more today, uh, not counting the one we're gonna hear from right now, which is from uh, our media co-host, Broadband Breakfast. And here to introduce Broadband Breakfast uh, is Drew Clark, a longtime associate and champion for uh, broadband uh, in the U.S. Uh, Drew is, uh, well, he's been on the forefront for, well, as long as I can remember. Uh, he, he helped us launch fiber to the library in the late 2000s and uh, has been on the scene at all the happenings and major developments in, in the world of broadband policy and events and, and projects in the U.S. So Drew, tell us, uh, tell us what's the latest with uh, Broadband Breakfast, and you've got three minutes, if you don't mind, to uh, cram all that in. Uh, it takes me a few minutes to introduce you, so please go ahead. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, I really appreciate the, the invite to say a word or two. Uh, Broadband Breakfast is a media company, but we're also an inclusive media community, and we've just uh, completed uh, a media kit we'd love to share with any of you who are interested. I would like to use my three minutes, if I may, maybe two and a half now, to introduce first uh, David Jelke, who's uh, his last day with Broadband Breakfast is today. He's just written a story about libraries and gigabit libraries. So take one minute to talk about your story, David. And then Emily McPhee, our assistant editor, will just give the action item for what each of you can do to learn about Broadband Breakfast and how potentially we can help get your message out. So David, go ahead and just say a minute or less on your story, if you don't mind. And sure. Drew, uh, please, excuse me, David. Drew, uh, go ahead and post uh, that link to your, to your upcoming session and, and to David's story, if you'd like. So welcome, David. Hi, Don. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Drew, for the intro. Uh, yeah, so I wrote and published a story recently just kind of investigating all the different things that libraries have done to both connect communities, but also far beyond that uh, during the pandemic. Um, personally, when I was little, I mean, I had a library card when I was 10, but that was part of a merit badge that I needed to get for Boy Scouts. And I honestly never used it beyond that. Um, so this is very interesting to research for me because I learned that libraries not only provide uh, essential connectivity for people who are applying to jobs, um, but also to connect with their loved ones, but uh, smaller, more unexpected things as well. I spoke with the head of a, a library in Millinock at Maine that actually would lend out uh, kayaks and canoes, and that was their most popular service. And a librarian, uh, I think in the south, in the southeast, um, 
would uh, would uh, offer these classes on mixology, yoga, and gardening. So it was really interesting to get to learn all the different things that libraries can do. And uh, I invite you to read my piece to learn more. Thanks. Well, and, and thank you, David. I just, I really appreciated um, the, the depth that he went in in this story and Don, the help you and your associates provided. Again, we've been happy to be your media co-host, want to help publicize, get the message out about what Gigabit Libraries Network is doing. Uh, and uh, we, we have a lot of good reporting from Washington. And let me again, just give a minute or less to Emily McPhee to just speak about how you can learn more about Broadband Breakfast. Well, thank you, Drew, and thank you, Don, um, at Broadband Breakfast. Like David was saying, we've covered all sorts of connectivity, including at libraries. We cover infrastructure, open access, the digital divide, Section 230, basically everything at the intersection of technology and policy. And we, um, you can read our stories if you sign up for our newsletter, which goes out twice per week. We've also, for the last couple months, been hosting weekly live online sessions on Wednesdays at 12 noon Eastern time on the impacts on broadband and connectivity from the coronavirus pandemic. So we'll be continuing those moving forward into the month of June. Well, right. Don, we've, we've done it in three minutes. Thank you again. The way this collaboration started is you scheduled something at 12 in Eastern time and I said, Don, what are you doing? So I'm really grateful you've, you've gone to this time and we really appreciate this collaboration and hope to continue to stay involved. Thank you. Same here, Drew. And, uh, and it was actually convenient for us to move an hour earlier because it allows our friends in, uh, uh, in Europe and parts of Africa and that whole uh, uh, time zone to participate. If we were later, it gets more difficult. It's already five and six and so on in the afternoon uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, thank you, David, for that, uh, that article. Uh, there were some quotes in there I might have tuned down a little bit, but you know, it, was, it was a good piece. You also uh, interviewed uh, Deb Fallows, who has just done this amazing series in the Atlantic on libraries. She and her husband uh, flew across the U.S. visiting, I don't know how many libraries, and wrote it up and, and wrote one particular thing about libraries as responders, which uh, was prescient to the current situation. And uh, Emily, thank you uh, for your words. Please post any links on the chat uh, that you'd like folks to check on, you know, where to subscribe to the mail list or, or to register for uh, some really interesting uh, gatherings that Drew and, and Broadband Breakfast put together every week. So thank you. We'll look for you back again, uh, hopefully next week, Drew. And, and uh, good luck, David, with your next endeavor. Okay. Uh, thanks a bunch, Don. It was a pleasure to interview you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks. All right. Uh, we're off here. And uh, let me. Yep. So uh, this, these are the 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 elements. I'm reviewing stuff that we typically do at the beginning of the session. I'll try to get through these uh, quickly here to get to our speakers. Uh, these are elements of the of the discussion we've been having. Our particular background is mostly in access and infrastructure, wired and wireless, uh, but also what's the point of access without something to actually reach people and content and digital services uh, for libraries has skyrocketed. Uh, internet access has become uh, an essential thing uh, rather than just something really important to have. Now it's, it's a practical necessity. Uh, Dealing with physical materials uh, is, a, is a big challenge. Maybe we'll hear some of, of that today as we get into our library reopening topic. And then social infrastructure, uh, uh, the role libraries play in their communities is key to the health of a community and how communities see and support their libraries, which are uh, mostly local. Certainly in the US, these are, these are local community institutions receiving 90% of their funding from uh, local sources, typically local government sources. Uh, our, our key point that we, that we make and we urge all librarians to make as they may go up against uh, budget challenges is that assuring access to public information is an essential service. And we use the term public information, we're not just talking about the open internet, 
We're also talking specifically about public sector, government information, e-gov, in a word, uh, all of the, uh, the important uh, information, and increasingly so now related to like health information, but that's just the beginning of, of what uh, libraries help people access. And, and that is an essential service. It should be deemed that, understood that by uh, emergency management and policymakers everywhere. It is what the libraries do and do uh, better than anyone. Uh, Gigabit Libraries is uh, bringing you this uh, uh, session. The series is an open collaboration of libraries uh, around the world doing interesting things, most notably, as I mentioned, in connectivity. I uh, just want to check in with everybody, see how they're holding up. You know, it's, it's been a while now, and, you know, at, at first it was, okay, we can do this. And then, uh, you know, and then by this month, May, which we're still in, it's, we're maybe getting a little bit frazzled. So uh, I can appreciate that. I'm fortunate to be in a, a fairly, live in a fairly nice place. It's easy to get out and, and just around the town. Uh, so it's not too bad. I was already kind of working from from home, so it's also not a great penalty. But I realize there are so many people that are dislocated, having trouble, not to mention, you know, suffering from dire consequences of health uh, challenges. But uh, on the bright side, uh, they're, they're well into the topic. There's the, the role that, I mean, these are things we all go through in normal times. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things we do about that is go to the library. And at the library, we can find things like, like uh, uh, happy spaces for, for kids and adults, and, you know, quiet places. And I, uh, I borrowed these from the uh, Cuyahoga uh, Library website. And I borrowed that first slide from, from the uh, uh, Gutterschloh, Gutterschloh uh, Library uh, and uh, as a fair use. But just to remind us what it is that, you know, not just the materials, the books and things, but the spaces that libraries represent. And uh, so uh, I, I like these images a lot here. Um, so we will move on to our speakers right now. It's, we've got a, a decent intro, I think. Uh, I want to thank Broadband Breakfast again. I want to thank uh, IFLA uh, for hosting these, recording these. They're all posted on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. You'll be getting a, a follow-up summary of today's presentations uh, in a day or two, and then the link will be there to find the recording for today's session, as well as the prior 10 sessions uh, for your convenience. We're trying to tag these so you can find the individual speakers. We're looking to move forward and index uh, with various topic tags that will help help these uh, uh, excellent speakers uh, be more available to, to your search. So with that, we're fortunate to have the uh, CEO of Stadtbibliothek Güterschloh with us today, Silke Niermann. And CEO is not usually the uh, title we hear for uh, the director of a library, but in uh, Güterschloh, it's exactly the correct term because the library there is an actual corporation, a nonprofit corporation. And Silica, why don't you take us away and give us a background on, on that, that very interesting uh, organizational strategy you had there, uh, a little bit about your town, how your library is doing, and some of the questions we talked about uh, earlier. Yeah. So welcome, Silica. Yeah, welcome. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to, um, yeah, give you a little look to Germany <laughs> and my little um, library. So I will, uh, what? Where's sharing? Sorry, I, yeah. I stopped sharing. Yeah, okay. We see you now, not the slide. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Did I stop your share? Yeah. I, yes, okay. Okay. Now you see the slide? I, I see you. No, not your slide. Sorry. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I was slow yeah. to stop screen wow. One moment. So there now. Okay. Is 
So right. this is the first slide. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <thank you. laughs> yes, it's a little uh, picture of our roof in the library. Um, so yes, um, ah, it's too far. So um, yes, um, um, Güter's Law in Germany. I have a little point there where it is. It's in the middle, north, middle of uh, Europe and Germany. And we have 103,000 citizens. Um, it's not a very big uh, town in Germany, but also not a small. Yes, um, I have some data uh, to the library. Um, I don't want to talk about it in detail. You'll see it. And um, when the presentation is, um, yeah, you can, can see it later um, on. The special uh, thing of our library is uh, that we are organized as a company. I uh, had it in the last line. Uh, our shareholders are the city of Gütersloh um, and the Bertelsmann Foundation. We have uh, two big um, companies in Gütersloh. Maybe someone knows it. Uh, it's first Miele, it's a, a kitchen um, producer, kitchen technique producer. Oh, someone has this uh, micro on, it's a little bit disturbing. Um, and uh, the second is uh, Bertelsmann, um, a great media company. Uh, you know Random House uh, as publisher, this is a part of um, Bertelsmann. And the Bertelsmann Foundation is um, Yes, our second shareholder. And uh, I have the little structure here. Um, many, many years we are uh, organized uh, in this form, like a nonprofit limited company. And uh, 51 person shareholdings are the city of Gütersloh, and uh, 49 uh, person shareholdings are the Bertelsmann Foundation. The 100% budget comes from the city. I um, yeah, have uh, one and nine million euro for one year to work with the library. Uh, it's also our building. We are um, uh, um, responsible for the building, for the techniques, for all, um, for the pers uh, personal um, finance, um, for all what is uh, needed to work, to, to, to um, make this library working. <laughs> Um, and from Bertelsmann Foundation, we get um, only, yeah, but only uh, some years um, budget for special projects. Um, it's only uh, um, only on one point uh, um, um, finance from from them. Um, yes, and we have uh, two reporting committees. Um, you yeah, the shareholder meeting with uh, both uh, City of Utah and Bertelsmann Foundation, and also the local political committee on culture and education. This is uh, the political um, part of our work uh, every year, two or three times in the year. I have to report there uh, about our uh, work at, on the last year and on our visions for the next year and also our financial uh, plans uh, for the next year. So this is um, our special structure, um, which, what, which made, uh, make us very independent uh, in working. So we, we can do things, we find it right for our library, not the, politi uh, the political uh, um, members or um, um, someone from the city. Um, we have, have a good communication between us, a very good communication. We um, see us as, a, as partners, um, but so Thanks, I, I, I am, yes, I'm Are a little you? bit the owner of this library and I'm, I'm responsible for all the work there. I very interesting, you, very yeah. interesting. I, I had a question for you, but I yeah. also wanted to ask people to mute, please. Uh, our, Steven Weiber has stepped away for a moment. I don't have the controls to find and, and mute people, uh, but if you're not muted, you may be making some noise. I apologize. Uh, this is interesting. Your partnership with Bertelsmann, Bertelsmann <laughs> is, is unusual. Uh, why, why Gütersloh? I mean, they, they, this is surely the only one place they do that, right? 
Uh, they are also in uh, Berlin and in, um, I think, yeah. New York, um, in Madrid. Um, they are worldwide active. Um, but it's um, the family of Bertelsmann, uh, well, the family Mohn, Reinhard Mohn, uh, comes uh, from um, Gütersloh. And uh, the senior um, owner of Bertelsmann, um, Liz Mohn, uh, lives there and her daughter and her grandchild, they go there to school, they visit our library. <laughs> it's a normal Gütersloh family. <laughs> well, it's great that they're taking some of the revenue that they're receiving from libraries around the world and feeding them back into libraries. That's a yeah. good sign. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I it was just thought it was really interesting how that, uh, that, that structure, and you also mentioned that your budget is set and funded one year at a time, so it's not subject to kind of momentary revisions as all other normal government agencies are. Uh, yes, please. Um, I, I, you don't have to, you don't, uh, uh, a normal uh, government agencies, a library that's part of a local government is subject to immediate uh, changes because of, you know, situations like now. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah, we have a contract with a um, with our shareholder, uh, the city. Uh, that's uh, the money or budget we uh, get for one year and in plan uh, two years um, uh, in 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 the future. Um, we have we have also a budget plan about uh, three years, the actual uh, year, and uh, the two years later. And this is the contract that this money will save for us. So we can work with it. Very good. Thank but you it's please. also it's also our risk if everything happens with the building um, and we have to spend uh, very much money to repair it. It's, so it's also our problem. So we have to save in our own budget the money to make the renovation or to repair big techniques, maybe. Thank you. Please. Oh, okay. <laughs> So uh, here are some pictures from inside the library. You see also many, um, well, we have many programs for children and adults, um, and uh, we have a, yes, um, um, a cafe, bistro, in the middle of our library in the center, so there. And uh, also for older people, seniors, we have uh, also programs. Um, it's uh, over 500 uh, programs, events in the year, all kinds of events. So it's uh, very, yeah, for, for us and our um, art of uh, form of library, a very busy library <laughs> every year. So this is, um, yeah, our timetable uh, of our, um, yeah, uh, uh, corona time, I will call it. Um, um, first, uh, in, in the middle of March, we have the total lockdown and we have to organize our team in two teams. Uh, they want, we have to separate it uh, very clear and uh, we have um, built up more tel telephone services, more ma mail services that our customers can contact, contact with us uh, over mail and over telephone. And um, we have uh, also um, the possibility for new customers uh, who want to use our digital services um, to, um, to get new, uh, new customers by our, uh, in, in our library over mail. We made it very easy um, for, for them. Also, uh, we have uh, decided to um, expand our e-resources uh, in such ways and um, yeah, to, to, um, to have more possibilities for the, for, for the uh, people to use digital services in this lockdown. And, uh, and in April, 22 of April, we have the first step of reopening. We call it uh, Bibliothèque to go. It's a uh, home delivery services where we uh, package books uh, and these books uh, are picked up at the door from the customers. Um, it's uh, without contact to the customers. Um, and uh, this was a little, yeah, little mini opening of our uh, 
physical media lending, um, first uh, little first step. And since uh, 5th of May, we have uh, the second step of reopening. Uh, we opened um, our library, the building again, um, only for lending and return media, only 40 people. We have also at uh, the time shorter opening times. Um, because we have to organize um, an extra entrance control and uh, have to do many, many uh, safety and um, hygiene uh, uh, standards uh, in, the, in our room, in the building. I have uh, some pictures um, at the next. And the uh, third step will come maybe next week. Yeah, we are in planning. Uh, we uh, plan to opening or to open our working spaces uh, for uh, students and for internet users. Um, this is what uh, the people missed all the time. And uh, but we have to prepare also the hygiene uh, standards at these uh, places and have to organize that there is a, a, a right distan uh, social distancing between the desks and the places. Um, yes, it's a yeah, little bit new organization again. Um, so this is um, some pictures. We have, um, um, I have uh, our info, information about our service, uh, Bibliothèque to go. There you see a little um, um, uh, package where the books are inside uh, and the people picked up. Um, and also a little collection of our digital services we, uh, we have and we um, build up more uh, with more resources. And we have, may, for instance, uh, a new one, um, uh, Overdrive, I think in the USA it's uh, very famous. Uh, for us it's very new with um, uh, uh, foreign language books. Um, we try it uh, now in the future to uh, as a new um, service for our user. Um, yes, so this is this are uh, some uh, pictures from uh, our precautions for reopening. You see on the bottom marks uh, where the people have to stop uh, to um, have yeah, to have the, the social distancing about one and a half meter or two meter. Uh, we have, um, yeah, you can't see it really good in the picture, but there are uh, plexiglass uh, to um, make it for our staff um, uh, safe, uh, the contact to our customer. Um, also here you see um, one of my colleagues with a face shield. Um, it's also for the safety uh, security for our Stuff when they are in the library with uh, customers um, go around and uh, made information service, also the information places. Yes, and this is uh, yeah, <laughs> this is uh, a, a closed working space. Maybe we open it uh, next week because uh, actually yesterday comes new rules from our uh, government that we have can open more and uh, then we actually have has a plan. So we have um, uh, next week and the first day morning, we have to plan all new what we, um, what we now have uh, uh, as an idea. So it's very yeah, dynamic uh, every week maybe with new ideas and uh, new um, organization um, ideas. Yes, um, for me it was um, yeah, good, uh, this inv invitation to think about what we learn uh, in this time um, for us as a library in Gütersloh. I can only um, tell about uh, Gütersloh and Germany. Um, we see that the library is also for the people an important digital place um, in this time of total lockdown and total closure. Um, we were one of the few in the city who has a digital services for people or either a service uh, for, for um, free time, for, for reading, for learning. 
uh, this was very for us uh, a good experience um, and also we see that we are a very flexible um, organization and we are able to shift from analog uh, extensive to digital and intensive use um, and we can now switch again in the other uh, direction um, it's not even easy for all in the stuff but uh, yeah we we can make it we we are able to do this also um, we see that more people even more people need training in digital literacy especially seniors uh, older people um, that they are not divided from the yeah development and for using uh, and get information in such a world like uh, this in the corona crisis um, and also that uh, social weaker people miss internet access um, they always telephone to us and ask ah, one at what time are you open that we can use uh, the internet places um, now next week i think uh, it will be again but now and so we we saw that they missed it very also uh, students missed uh, the working space in the library some students are now in homeschooling um, um, most of the days in the week and they have in families or at her, their home not so good um, um, places to learn many uh, sister brothers uh, always loud and so um, the library is for them a, a good place for learning and they missed it also um, we we saw that uh, parents need uh, support for homeschooling um, also in in digital services um, they asked us sometimes um, what can we do with our kids what is a good uh, e-resource uh, resource uh, or the flat platform so um, this is also an experience and uh, the people miss the library as their third place um, uh, we saw it um, in the last uh, week when we are opened only for lending and return and every day people uh, stood in front of our entrance and said oh can we go inside only sit and reading newspaper and uh, drink a coffee and we said no it's not possible yet but maybe yeah in some weeks um, and a very important experience for us for all of us or for me especially as a ceo was that our staff need more training in using digital tools to work together in separate uh, places um, we have um, many of our some uh, people some staff uh, members in ho uh, home office and uh, we have to use video meetings and there are not very um, uh, fit in this uh, so we have in the future in the next weeks trained this also to use digital tools to build up digital services for um, for customers um, we see that we or we want to um, make video tutorials uh, for them um, to um, um, give it to to youtube um, and so this i think we have to to engage more time to uh, train our our staff in this um, competence yes and we have also made an experience we miss our customers and visitors <laughs> it was uh, um, yeah we have a very busy uh, library normally and now it was um, yeah no noise no people it was uh, a little bit mystery um, many weeks um, so it's um also the question what and what we must do now for the future and um, i have some points um i for us it's more investments in e-resources and uh, also affordable uh, license terms that we can pay this what we need <laughs> investments in uh, IT infrastructure uh, to, to work uh, in home office and to work separate um, and also to make services for the people 
um, like uh, video tutorials, um, also investment in digital skills of the stuff. And I found, uh, well, found yeah, I found in preparation of this uh, um, date, a uh, good uh, paper, uh, actual paper from the EPLIDA, it's uh, the Euro European um, Library Association, because, um, uh, over or about uh, preparing uh, a library agenda after COVID. All the points um, come are in this paper, and um, it's uh, the uh, thoughts about uh, what what we need in the future, what is important, and for us it's very important, I think it's very important for us as libraries to show the community what we do in this time and what uh, are the, our experiences and the customers' feedbacks. And we need it for lob lobby work. And uh, we had in our region uh, in Germany, uh, from our uh, little uh, library uh, association department in, in North Rhine-Westphalia, the area about uh, Gütersloh uh, social media campaign. I show you here a little screenshot uh, from our um, um, uh, uh, <laughs> newsletter. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, posting from our posting on. Um, I think it was on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And um, this is um, that we want to show uh, the local politicians. Uh, and uh, the important uh, um, people in government, in local government, that uh, the customers are very uh, thankful for our services in the lockdown and now also at this time, um, that we are always there for them. We are visible in this time where every, every, all every, um, uh, every uh, other uh, institutions are not visible or were not visible. And um, you can see it. Um, here I have all uh, our contacts, also our Facebook account, Instagram, on YouTube. You see also some films about our work and our library and our school libraries. And um, I think um, this was my last sentence. Uh, the best public library is an open library full of people, good service, and excellent collections of media. So. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Danke sehr. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you related to handling physical materials. Uh, well, actually three. One is, uh, are, you, are you quarantining books that return in the circulation process? Uh, how, do you, how do you plan to handle toys for children? Uh, uh, that sounds like a challenge. Uh, yeah, we, and uh, and you have staff issues, people reluctant to return to work, uh, you know, concerned about uh, the virus, and also uh, heavily used print materials like newspapers and so forth. Those are all kind of uh, challenges. Uh, the ones on the physical and then on staff. Can you speak to those? Um, yes, we have. Um, when I, I hope I understand the question right. Um, um, we we have um, I, I will say we have an, a very practical side of this um, um, organ organization of of uh, uh, lockdown and and uh, now uh, the uh, reopening. Uh, we said okay, the important for all of us is uh, social distancing, private people with us uh, in in the stuff. Uh, and also uh, um, uh, standards in hygiene. Um, I, I hope you understand to wash hands. Yes. Um, and to wear ma masks um, also. And so we um, we can't not as a library uh, be the uh, safety police. Um, we want to to have a very um, easy going um, way to, to uh, organize um, this situation. Uh, I hope okay. th this was- Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I can appreciate you're trying to keep everybody safe. It must be a special ch challenge with children. Uh, yeah. Kinder, they, they like to yeah. put everything in their mouth, you know, so- um, Yeah, but, uh, but, but this, uh, we, we, we took all uh, the, uh, this away. Um, yeah, sure. we, we made a, a li Today, at this time, it's a, a clear library. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> Vielen Dank. Uh, uh, Cindy Aiden, the uh, state librarian from Washington, offers you a, a message there. Uh, uh, Silke, thank yeah. you. Today. Thank you today. And uh, we need to turn now to uh, Rebecca. Are you with us? I hope. Rebecca yeah. Ranalo, <coughs> or is it Ranalo? Ranalo. Ranalo. You're yes. correct. Yeah. We've, we've spoken, and I, we, I, you know, we often don't use last names, so I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. But welcome. Uh, right. Rebecca heads uh, IT uh, literacy program uh, for uh, the very substantial Cuyahoga County Public Library System. And I will let uh, Becky, as she's calling herself, uh, give us the background on the system and how you're dealing with all these and, and this question of space. I mean, there's space outside of the libraries too, right? So is, are those changing? Uh, anyway, I, it's, it's interesting that you, the head of li IT literacy, will talk to us about physical space, but I know you're up to it. Welcome, sure Rebecca. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the invite, Don. I appreciate being here. Um, so as Don mentioned, I am the head of, uh, my title is actually the Information and Technology Literacy Manager for our system. Um, and so I am actually located within our programming division uh, with the system. My team heads up um, all of our programming that is predominantly technology based. Uh, so while we have other groups within our programming division that work on um, age-related programming, so for adults or for youth, we, uh, we manage all programming that involves technology of some sort. Now, there's a lot of overlap between our groups, um, but my team in particular handles all of our STEAM and STEM programming for youth. Um, our programming that is... Um, related to technology training. So I have four technology trainers on my staff and they do all of our technology training for the public and then support for our staff as well. Um, and we also run uh, four, soon to be six, uh, innovation center maker spaces. And so we do all of the logistics support for staff and um, all of the support in terms of staff learning and comfort. Um, so that is specifically who we are um, within the context of our system. Um, you know, in any given two weeks, so for instance, I provided all of our STEM programming for um, a program that was going to go on in early May, and we had 150 STEM programs throughout our locations in a two week period. So we do a lot of programming, or we did a lot of programming. Um, for some context on who we are as a system, um, Cuyahoga County Public Library is the suburban system. Um, Cuyahoga County is the county that, uh, in which Cleveland resides. Uh, so we are the suburban system that exists outside of Cleveland. We serve 47 of the commun suburban communities um, outside of the city. Uh, our communities are everything from some of the wealthiest areas uh, within the suburbs to um, some of the most economically challenged locations uh, that, you know, I mirror some of the poverty that, that Cleveland itself sees. Um, if you know anything about Cleveland, too, uh, it ranks consistently within the top five of the least digitally con connected uh, cities in the country. Um, so there are real challenges uh, within some of our service area for connections um, and, and digital connectivity. Um, we are one of the busiest uh, library systems in the country per capita, and we consistently rank um, close to the top. We actually are, I have been the number one library according to Library Journal for uh, nine years now in a row. Um, so we uh, provide a lot of services um, and a lot of materials. Uh, we have 27 locations, I believe I mentioned, and we have uh, just over 550 full-time staff. Um, so we, um, it is both a busy system and then there is a lot of work uh, that we do making sure that our staff feel supported and comfortable when it comes to technology um, and work with technology. Um, so here in Ohio, um, our last day open was March 13th. 
uh, it happened quickly. Uh, the week of <laughs> March 13th, we went from talking about canceling programs for the rest of March to being completely closed within the space of just a couple of days. And um, because we closed fast, uh, there were some pieces, uh, you know, that, that now feel like we wish we'd been able to do things that we will think of in the future if we ever have to, although hopefully not do this again. Um, if, for instance, uh, you know, this is an uncomfortable spot for us. We know much like all of the other libraries on this call, I, I feel very comfortable making this generalization, people come to us for access. And this has been a time that has been very intensive for digital access. And so closing and closing quickly meant that a lot of our customers who only had us to rely on lost that ability very quickly. Um, and that has been a huge concern for us um, as we have moved forward. It also meant that things that we do to alleviate that lack of access, um, like loaning hotspots, while we had um, just over 600 hotspots that were out and stayed out with customers, we also know that we still have 100 hotspots that are sitting on hold shelves waiting to be picked up from customers um, that have been waiting since March 13th, and we just didn't have a way to get those out. And so for us, that was very uncomfortable. Um, and has remained uncomfortable. While we have done quite a bit of work around electronic resources, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment, um, it has been very hard for us to know that we cannot provide the amount of access that we normally provide um, in a way that we would like to be. Um, and so while we have provided access from our parking lots to our Wi-Fi, um, and I can say here that from March 13th through the end of April, we had 44,350 sessions on our Wi-Fi. That was customers sitting either outside of our branches or in their cars in our parking lots. Um, that number is huge and it doesn't make us happy. We are happy that we could provide that access, but we hate that it had to be in someone's car in a parking lot. Um, we also saw a huge increase in our electronic resources though, and that's great, but again, it only covers our customers who have that access at home and have a device and know how to use it. Um, we saw a 27% in increase in our resources overall in our online resources. Um, that number is big. It's not as big, I think, as some other libraries saw. We were pretty, um, we did a lot to promote those resources ahead of time. Um, and because um, Overdrive is literally within our service area, they are in our backyard, um, and they have been a very close partner from their inception. Um, our previous executive director and our current executive director were both very involved in um, the early days of Overdrive and helping them develop their service to public libraries. And so we have always been um, a strong customer with them, and quite a few years ago, we really increased our buying of electronic titles. And we've seen that um, we're one of Overdrive's libraries that routinely circs over a million um, titles a year, or a million copies a year, not titles. Um, but so that is that has been very consistent for us. Um, see a balloon floating around behind me, my four-year-old is back there hitting a balloon in the air. So um, it was bound to happen sooner or later on this webinar. She always makes an appearance. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, some of the other areas though, while well, we expected digital titles uh, to, to continue to be strong during this time, um, we also have uh, some other services that have seen a lot of increase in access. In particular, Canopy, which is a moving st movie streaming service, um, has been a great uh, option for our customers, but one that I think they really didn't see as much until, um, until this, this shutdown for us. Uh, we've seen a 96% increase in access to Canopy um, since our closure on the 13th. And um, in, in particular, I, in the early days in March, Canopy uh, had so many people suddenly flocking to them that they were having trouble keeping up. Um, you know, you, you as, as an online resource company, you don't know what your capacity is going to be until you really see something like this 
um, hit your servers. And so they're uh, back in business now and our customers have really been enjoying it. Um, during the time that we've been closed, we've been slowly ramping up our online content. Um, we've done lots of promotion on social media in particular. Those channels have been um, you know, our, our place where we can really promote what we have. Um, our digital signage is out promoting, you know, coming in and using our Wi-Fi, but social media has been the best place um, for our administrative staff and some of our branch staff to promote um, content, to promote usage, to promote projects, uh, because we have maker spaces. We've been still trying to keep up with um, some of those making activities that were so popular with our customers. Um, we are in the process. Today is my last full day at home. Um, on Monday, we will be reopening 11 locations that have drive up windows. Um, we will be reopening for materials only. I suppose I should preface that with. Um, our staff will be back in our locations. Uh, currently, our 550 plus staff are all working at half time. Um, we will continue working at half time through at least June. Um, but staff will be back in our locations on staggered schedules starting Monday. Um, of our locations, we have 11 with drive up windows and those will be open for eight hour days um, for materials pickup. And then we have two that will be working on curbside pickup. Uh, that's a pilot with those two. And if it goes well, I would not be surprised if those um, hours extend a bit or those locations extend to additional places. Um, we're fortunate that these locations kind of strategically fill out our, um, our locations within our service area so that all of our customers have somewhere that's geographically close um, to go to to retrieve their materials. We know that we currently have 400,000 materials out in the community. Um, that were lent out before we closed and that we have just extended the loan terms on. Um, we, we hope they don't all come back on Monday, but we do expect them to start coming back into us as we open. Um, we also are aware that we have 45,000 holds in our system. So those are materials that our customers put on hold and we're unable to pick up before we close. Um, our staff will be reaching out as they return, we'll be reaching out to our customers to see if those items are still wanted. And if not, they'll be moving them on to the next person in the holds queue. Um, again, we're a little bit nervous about what that might look like, especially next week, um, but we do have the ability, you know, we're, we're gonna do the best we can and um, we have the ability to open at this point without customers. Um, we do not expect customers to be back in our branches until at least July. Um, right now, the governor of Ohio still has an order in place that limits any gathering um, to 10 people or less. And so that really, um, that really is hard to maintain in a library, in a public space. Even if we socially distance, you know, we've moved all of our tables in preparation for opening for, for customers. Um, we're working on our lab, our computer lab spaces, but to limit to 10 people um, is really a challenge. And so until that eases up a bit, uh, we will be close to customers. Uh, so the first challenge for us is really um, how we handle materials, what we see coming in uh, starting next week. But I think most of us are excited to get back in the office, at least in some capacity, um, and to, to start looking at what our, our service model looks like for the time being, knowing that it will continue to evolve constantly. Um, so one of the things that Don also asked me to talk about though um, is a little bit of the work we're doing. Obviously, we're not holding in-person programs. For customers and as a really programming heavy system um, that was a big change for us but um, one of the things that we are working on is a lot of virtual content uh, virtual author visits uh, but we're also working on converting our stem camps that we do traditionally in the summer into virtual stem camps for kids this summer um, so in the past uh, we have offered around uh, 70 STEM related camps for children ages um, about six or seven through uh, teenage. And most of our teenagers that we see, they kind of cap off around 14. We generally don't get kids who are older than that. Um, so we have offered in-person camps. 
uh, where the kids come in, they register, they come in and they uh, take a camp for three or four days a week. It's a pretty deep, immersive learning experience. Um, before the pandemic, we had actually planned to change that model this year. Um, while we loved that model and we understood what a great learning experience it was for our customers, we also, uh, through some research on um, and some real data monitoring last year, realized that we were only serving about 750 kids in our community. And we have thousands of children in our community. And that was just not, the equity wasn't there for us when it came down to it. And so we had planned to offer, um, offer summer camps daily in seven of our branches where we see the most economic challenge um, and we see the most need. And, and frankly, we see kids in our branches every day all summer long. Um, and then the rest of our branches were going to do a learn with the library one afternoon a week. Those were gonna be mostly staff led. Um, and we had spent the last few months of 2019 and the first few months of 2020 really working on what that was gonna look like. And we put in a lot of work and we really hope we can use it next year because it was a lot of our time that went into it. Um, and then pretty quickly we understood that we just weren't gonna be able to do that. Um, we can't put kids in a room like that and expect them to stay separate um, and, and to be comfortable with it. And, and really at this point, we're not even gonna open for customers until July. So my team has been working on an alternative model. Um, and that alternative model is eight weeks of STEM challenges. Uh, we have what we're calling celebrities. Um, it's kind of a mix though. You know, We have every, everyone from the coach of the Cleveland Indians, our baseball team, um, to a NASA astronaut, to um, a chef in the area um, and a whole host of others um, talking about how they use STEM in their daily lives, um, how they use that in their jobs. And then uh, we have a video clip of that that we'll put up each week. And then my staff um, have done some uh, challenges for youth that follow that video clip. They introduce a challenge. It's a challenge that um, utilizes things that you either commonly have in your home or you could easily acquire at this point. Um, and we've challenged the, the youth in our area to go ahead and um, do that challenge every week. If they do, they can um, check in online in our summer reading game and um, get earn a digital badge. Um, and they also can earn um, towards prizes for summer reading. Um, that's one piece of it. Uh, we had really hoped to have an in-person uh, program as well where, uh, where youth came into our branches and um, could do the challenge there, could earn a paper badge to put up on the wall. We may still make that happen in July, um, but we're not quite sure that that's going to be uh, a reality. But it is not lost on us that in putting this online, and making it available that way, we're gonna lose a lot of our kids too. Yeah. Um, and a lot of families who don't have access. Yeah. Um, so that's part of it. We will also be hosting um, some Zoom sessions. Uh, we have a partnership through our local STEM ecosystem uh, and we'll be uh, utilizing Harvard's Lab Exchange pro, uh, platform to host some um, coding sessions throughout the summer for youth and some um, 3D design and scratch programming as well. Um, so I, I want to say, uh, kind of just to wrap it up here, we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> I think that everything we do, you know, we've learned so much from everything we've planned. My team works so much with innovation within our system. And um, for us, innovation isn't always a, a brand new idea, but it's very much about looking back at what we've done, what's worked, and then how to take it and spin it um, and make it fit what our needs are right now. And that's absolutely with what we'll do, what we'll, we'll be doing with what we know um, and what we'd like to see happen moving forward. Wow, that's amazing, Rebecca, uh, Becky, sorry. No, um, okay. So many challenges. And, uh, I saw a little head popping up behind you there. And it, <laughs> I guess it's the new version of uh, just a minute, honey, mommy's on the phone. <laughs> yes. This if you like noticed before different. I was speaking, I had to get up and get her snacks at one point. Of course, too. of course, of course. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, one, one quick question for you here relates to, uh, getting the word out, you, you know, social media. <clears throat> well, 
these are obviously for people that have connections. So how do you get the word out for people that don't have a connection? About you know, um, we are strongly connected within the community. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned we've got, you know, we're, we we're, we cover quite a geographic area. And so for us, um, we have strong partnerships with a lot of local organizations. We utilize their partnering skills when we're offering programming. Um, we've spread the word through them. We have 22 school districts that we work with that we've also spread the word through. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's putting it up on our digital signage. We're not, um, I don't think we found the magic bullet here, Don. I, I, I think it pains us that we're probably still losing a lot of families that aren't connected in any way. Yes. Um, and, and that's, that's hard. Well, that's, that is hard. I appreciate the, the challenge and the difficulty. That's part of our mission is to try to find ways to uh, provide access to the people that, that don't have that. The students is a whole topic we will get into at another time. But right now, I'd like to uh, try something. If everybody could unmute, would you unmute, please, everybody? Or Steven, if you can unmute everybody, that'll be great. Great. So, uh, so I'd like to thank our speakers and uh, uh, Silka and, and Becky for their presentations and give them uh, a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Feeling dunk, Silky. Feeling dunk. Herzliche Einladung nach Deutschland und Gütersloh. Uh, Happy yeah. welcome. Invitation to, okay. to me, to, uh, to us in to Gütersloh. Okay. Well, with that, we'll close the session. We do hang around uh, afterwards, but let's officially uh, close the recording now, Stephen. Thank you.